<laughs> oh, look at this! The rain stopped. It's done. It's done for the day. The rest of the the rest of the anniversary is easy sailing. Um, except I, I we're still going to go through the morass later. If you if if anybody is coming on the 154th Tennessee uh, hike, we're gonna and eh, we're gonna go through a, over here. We're not really going to go through the morass. Um, but here we have, this is Ray Field behind us. And uh, this was a field that was, uh, it is one of the fields at Shiloh that is the least like it was at the time of the battle, uh, geographically speaking, or at least in terms of the woodlands, uh, the woodland, uh, in terms of the hills and the streams, it is, it is the same. Uh, but the Ray Field uh, was a long, narrow field about half the width of this that went all the way down to the bridge where we started our program this morning. Uh, the bridge near Humphrey Woodyard's place where Humphrey, Humphrey Woodyard made his stand. That was a clear open field all the way down there. Um, basically, uh, maybe from about where I'm standing to the eastern wood line, it went straight down. Now, as you can see, most of that field, the long, narrow part of the field, is, is grown over now. Uh, but you, during, the, during the daylight, you would have been able to see all the way down that uh, field to the other end. And also, the woods over here went all the way to the creek. And now the woods are this 50 yards or so of woodland here that would have been clear back to the creek at the time. The Ray Field was, at that time, temporarily the home of the 53rd Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Colonel Jesse J. Appler, commanding. And they would have been camped right here in this part of the field. You see the camp tablet straight down the line here. And so the parade ground was right here where the mowing uh, where the lawn is mowed, and then the camp was in this direction. Uh, a Civil War regiment is at authorized strength, is composed of 10 companies, of 100 men in each company, so an authorized strength of 1,000. Uh, they never operated at their authorized strength. Uh, the 53rd Ohio had 640 men in their camp here at Shiloh, and so there's the regimental parade ground, and then 10 rows of Sibley tents. The Sibley tent is the large teepee looking tent that the Army used at the time. And then 10 rows of Sibley tents with company streets in between. Behind the Sibley tents, the officers' tents. Behind the officers' tents, the animals, because an uh, infantry regiment still had wagons, uh, and the wagons were pulled by mules or horses. Uh, and then a hay park, and then on into the woods, the officers' uh, sink. Uh, the officer's latrine was over there, and then the enlisted latrine was uh, uh, 120 or so paces uh, in front of the parade ground. So that's what this home, that's what this camp would have looked like. It's also what every other camp in the, uh, in, in the Union encampment here at Shiloh looked like. All laid out the same. Parade ground, company streets. Rows of tents, officers in the back, animals behind the officers. Uh, officers and men, separate latrines uh, in different directions. So on the morning of April 6th, Colonel Appler had also been up all night, like Colonel Peabody uh, down the road had been. He'd sent out a listening post, and they had reported back that they thought they were Confederates at the far end of Friendly Field. Uh, Colonel Appler was very nervous about all of this. Uh, he had already uh, sent a report of him that the Confederates were coming to General Sherman, and General Sherman had sent back uh, a reply insulting him. Take your damn regiment back to Ohio. And uh, there's no enemy any closer than Corinth. So Appler was very nervous during the night of April 5th and 6th. Uh, early on the morning of April 6th, he heard the fighting, of course. He heard the, the encounter between Powell and Hardcastle in Fraley Field. 
At that time, he sent two of his companies out to support the pickets. So out to support Captain Stevens of the 77s and Captain Ribbon, I think, of the 57s. And uh, Captain Messenger took, took them out. Very quickly, those companies came rushing back and uh, one of the captains said to Colonel Appler, uh, there are rebels out there thicker than fleas on a dog's back. And at that point, Appler finally called the 53rd into, uh, had, the, the, had the long roll sounded, called the 53rd into battle formation, in the line of battle on their parade ground. Uh, he immediately had them march to the south end of the camp, reorient facing to the south. Why? Because at that time, the field was open all the way to the other end. And with the sun up, Appler could see all the way down to the other end. And as, uh, as General Wood and his brigade pushed uh, Colonel Moore and his men out of sea field, they marched straight across the south end of that field. They just marched right by Colonel Appler, straight across and disappeared into the woods behind him, uh, or to his left. So at that point, Appler had his men redeploy uh, to the wood line on the east side of the field. Uh, and he, he, he gave the order, uh, about faced regiment right wheel. He gave the, that was the first time any of the men in the regiment had ever heard those words said. Uh, and they had no idea, no earthly idea what Appler meant. Uh, the, we're supposed to what? And a wheel? Where? Where? where where's the wheel? Uh, so instead, they just ran. Um, and they just sort of swarmed back through the camp, and then they rallied on the east side of the camp. It wasn't a right wheel at all. It was just sort of a swarm through. And then finally, Appler had them in the, uh, uh, in the, in the wood line right there. And that wood line's about right. They marched back in there, and they laid down. By this time, the two regiments from General Claiborne's brigade that had not redeployed to attack through the morass came marching up across that branch and up over the hill. Six Mississippi in front, and the, or the Six Mississippi on the left and the 23rd Tennessee on the right, but because they're moving oblique to the Union order of battle, to the Union line of battle, the Six Mississippi is much closer uh, because they're facing this way. So the 6th Mississippi came up out of that low ground. They moved straight into the camp of the 53rd Ohio. Now think about what I just said about the layout of the camp. Parade ground, 10 rows of Sibley tents with company streets in between. That means when the Mississippians got, moved, got into the camp, it broke up their formation. It broke up their line of battle and it forced all of the men into the company streets. And so the men were all just crowded in the company streets. At that moment, Colonel Appler gave the order for the 53rd Ohio to rise up out of their position and fire a volley right into their own camp. And of course, they just fired their volley straight down those company streets. So this is, this is a shooting gallery. This is a shooting gallery for those Buckeyes, and the 6th Mississippi is just balled up uh, in that camp, and they're just, they were just shot to pieces. At this point, some of the Ohioans, the uh, Company A and Company B, had Enfield rifles. So those 57 caliber uh, rifle Enfield balls, mini balls, uh, at that range, which would have been uh, uh, maybe 25 yards when they were over there, would have gone through one guy and shot the person behind him. Uh, it was really a devastating volley. At the same time, this battery of artillery, Waterhouse's battery, opened fire, and they could open fire and draw a case shot, an exploding shot, right into the 53rd camp. Very quickly, the 6th Mississippi and the 23rd Tennessee were repulsed. That's why General Claiborne was trying to get the brigade back together. That's how General Claiborne got thrown. The 23rd Tennessee retreated and they did not rally. They did not rally until much later in the morning. The 6th Mississippi rallied and they tried it again. They came straight up. I think they might have displaced a little to the left and then to the second attack come through where we are right now. 
Uh, and again, the 53rd Ohio fired into their flank, and again they took fire from the batteries of artillery on this high ground, and again they were shot to pieces and fell back. Uh, during the second attack, Colonel Appler gave his most famous order of the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, he leapt to his feet and he cried, Retreat and save yourselves! And the 53rd Ohio followed his order. Uh, the regiment stampeded from its position over here east of the field, even though they were winning, at least at that point. They stampeded and they, and, and they stampeded for the rear. And of course, the reason they did this, a number of reasons, of course, Appler panicked. Also remember, all of these uh, Confederates had already passed into those woods and were behind them. At any moment, Appler knew they could turn on their flank and come right on up behind the 53rd Ohio and they'd be done. Uh, I don't know exactly why Appler gave the order other than panic. Other than panic. Fear. And so he gave the order and the 53rd Ohio retreated. Finally, the third time the 6th Mississippi attacked through here. They attacked through the camp and by that time the 53rd Ohio was gone. It took about 15 minutes. This battle took about 15 minutes and the 6th uh, Mississippi entered the battle with 425 uh, men. They entered that camp with 425 men, and after the end of the 15 minutes of engagement, 300 of them were casualties. 300 were killed, wounded, or missing of the 425. 70% casualties in the 6th Mississippi. Um, and, uh, and so, later, when the battle was over, the men from 53rd Ohio came back, and they had to take all of the bodies out of their camp, and they buried them down uh, down in the ravine over here, you can go to one of the Confederate burial trenches, you can go over there and visit that. Is wood, is wood behind them? Wood was behind them by that time. He had already passed through the through the extension of Fre uh, Rayfield, and he was in the gap. And that's where we're going to go right now. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about on this program is that the Union line of battle, the 5th Division, Sherman's 5th Division, and Prentice's 6th Division, did not connect. They did not connect, and Colonel Peabody's 25th Missouri is the westernmost unit in the 6th Division, and Colonel Appler's 53rd Ohio is the easternmost unit in Sherman's 5th Division, camped right here. So as we move down this road toward our cars, uh, once we pass the wood line, once we pass the, the place where the 53rd Ohio made their brief stand, we are moving into the gap, uh, into the gap in the line. Uh, and you're not going to see a tablet marking the gap in the line. Uh, as we talked about before, there's a bias in favor of things we know. There's a bias in favor of things that happen. Uh, there's not a tablet saying nothing happened here at Shiloh. Uh, but indeed, lots of things happened. It's just a matter of whether we know. <clears throat> Had to know for some certainty. So we're about to move. Once we get down the road into that wood line, that's the gap. That's the gap in the Union line. That's where Sherman got shot, and that's where his aide got killed. Or at least one of the books. Near it. You know, um, one of the books said they set their guns up uh, where the aide's body was. Where the aide's, okay, okay. Uh, I've, seen a, uh, I've seen someone draw a map. One of the veterans drew a map of exactly where it was and put an X on it. Uh -huh. And that X was uh, over here between the uh, monument of the 53rd Ohio and the, the oh, okay. woods. Uh, I'm not saying either one is yeah. definitive. Uh, okay. I'm just saying, yeah, there's people that say it's one one place or the other. Now, the guy that told the story, the guy that told the story about, General, look to your right. Yeah. This guy's named Doss. He's a lieutenant in the 53rd. He was standing here. Oh. Because uh, he was the adjutant of the regiment, so his post in the line of battle was on the right flank. And he said he had been at his post, and then when once they got in the woods, he came out to see, he wanted to look over the hill and see you know, because he couldn't see through the tents. So he came out to where the section of artillery from Waterhouse's battery was. And uh, from there, he could see Sherman. Now, where Sherman was, he just said, oh, I, I could see Sherman. So I think Sher I think Sherman was down over there, because one of the veterans of the 53rd wrote a map, and he said, put an X, and said, this is where Sherman was shot. Let's move on down. <coughs> Hello, Mona. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm sorry about that this morning, but it was unavoidable. 
Not to worry. Not to worry. We talked the... about Major Powell and Major Hart. Yeah. You know them. Yeah, but I wanted to do the first part of this one. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we made it back. And uh, we have, uh, I think what we've tried to establish during, during this hike is that a lot happened between the first shot at, uh, at uh, 4.55 in the morning and the supposedly descent of the Alpine avalanche. The, the descent of the supposed Alpine avalanche upon the Union camps, which occurred uh, at about 7.30. The first artillery firing being at 7.10. Uh, that's a lot of time. And that was a lot of time for General Prentice here in, uh, in this camp and for General Sherman over there to get their divisions organized, to get their men out of their camps, and to get them deployed. Uh, the case of the 53rd Ohio, which we just talked about, is one of the cases where, one of the few cases where uh, the Federals were not prepared <coughs> to meet the Confederates. And even then, the 53rd was prepared enough, they just didn't have a commander who was prepared uh, to meet the Confederates and fight. Uh, so, so, what happened? The time that was bought between the opening of the battle and the first attack on the first camps was extraordinarily valuable to the Union defense of their camps. Um, the, I've been told, uh, 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 I've been told by a, uh, a friend who comes to these programs, Perry from Oklahoma. <clears throat> Perry likes to think of the, of the battle as being a window an open window of opportunity. And at the beginning of the battle, the window is wide open for the Confederates. And then it starts to close. As the, talk, as the clock ticks by, the window starts to close. And everything that delays the Confederates, everything that delays the Confederates from just a few minutes of skirmishing to a couple of hours of heavy combat at these first two division camps, everything that delays the Confederates that window closes. And so by the end of the day, uh, when the Confederates are unable to make um, an attack across the Dill Branch Ravine against Grant's last line, unable to make an effective attack, uh, that window slams shut. And so for the, from the point of view of the Federals, every minute they buy reduces the Confederate opportunity and helps them. Again, they're waiting for Buell. And so the stuff we've been talking about this morning is therefore very important to the Battle of Shiloh, even though it's not the kind of stuff, it's not the kind of activity that results in too many tablets being placed on the ground. Again, we say in the skirmish fighting, there are very few landmarks, uh, very few places to say this happened right here. Uh, it's just skirmishing happened in those woods in these two hours before the battle. Uh, so that brings us to the, to the end of our first two programs. We've done our best to interpret from the beginning to the battle, from the beginning of the battle to the beginning of the real battle uh, in our first uh, few hours. And so the next programs you're going to see are going to be about those parts of the battle that are what they call general engagement at the time. Uh, the lines of battle facing each other and shooting each other at short range, piling up the casualties uh, by the hundreds. Um, and that's the next chapter of the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, so clearly, I think we've demonstrated on our, on our uh, uh, walk here that the Confederate attack was not an Alpine avalanche, unless you count glaciers as an Alpine avalanche. Uh, it was instead a, a ponderous, <laughs> but very powerful, unstoppable, slow but unstoppable advance across the landscape searching for the Union line of battle, searching through the woods and across the creeks for this Union line of battle so that when they found the Union line of battle, then they could launch that devastating attack. So thank you very much. If you have any questions for me, I think we have a few minutes for questions. 
Uh, other than that, off we go to our next program. Well, Camp Sherman writes in his official report he made two visits to Appler's Camp okay. in the morning. And nothing else says that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if I know you did a lot of research. Yeah, I've done a lot of looking at that. I only know of uh, Sherman coming out the one time personally. Uh, the first uh, on the on the uh, morning of the sixth, the first uh, uh, word to Sherman appears to have gone from Lieutenant Colonel Fulton. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Fulton uh, carried a message up to Sherman. At the same time, another messenger went to Colonel Hildebrand, which is the actual chain of command. Uh, and, but Colonel Hildebrand had his uh, headquarters at Shiloh Church, and Sherman was around there at the same time. His headquarters was just a few feet away. Um, so uh, Appler got the order from Hildebrand to send the two companies to support the skirmish. Uh, when Fulton came back from Sherman, Fulton's, uh, Sherman's only message to Appler was, you must be very scared over there. And then that's, that, that was all he said then. Then finally, Sherman came, I only know of once, okay, yeah. uh, once with his aide and with some other, that's when the, they were fired upon, uh, and uh, the aide, uh, Corporal Holiday, was killed. Over here? As you look at the Confederates, you're looking back there at the 6th Mississippi yeah. and uh, Tennessee and what, the one? 23rd Tennessee? 23rd Tennessee. Yeah. You got Wood in here. Yes. Schaefer. Shaver. Shaver. Yeah. And then, and then Gladden. And then Gladden after that, yeah. All of them moving from a, uh, in a northeasterly direction against defenses that are facing south. So when each of them encounters the enemy, they have to stop and reorient. Now this is Bragg, is it not? Uh, Hardy's Corps. Hardy's Corps is is the first one. Although Gladden belongs to Bragg, to Bragg and he's on loan because they moved him moved him up that night the night before. And then uh, Chalmers and Jackson, oh, yes. they're they're behind and to the right of Gladden. <laughs> yeah. So eventually they come up. Eventually <clears throat> Chalmers adds himself to the fight in the, in the last moments of the fight against the uh, camp, Chalmers uh, and then he and Jackson are pulled back out of the way. Where is Miller now between here and where Prentice's headquarters are? Is it Colonel Madison Miller's brigade? Yeah. Uh, if you go straight down this road, we're on the right or, or western flank of Peabody's brigade right here, 25th Missouri tablet right there. So the next four regiments are in line of battle down this road. When you cross the Eastern Corinth Road, you cross it into Madison Miller's zone of operation. Uh, and so when you the fighting in the Spain field, and then the fighting north of the Spain field, uh, that's Miller, uh, the 18th Missouri and the <coughs> 61st uh, Illinois, 18th uh, Wisconsin Red Yeah, pretty rough over there, didn't it? It did. It did. The uh, over there, there's much, uh, a much more dramatic landscape, uh, much deeper ravines. And so the, when the Confederates attacked through that Spain branch ravine, it's a steep ravine they came up over in the Spain field. Uh, some very, very desperate fighting. Okay, now what was, what was west of uh, uh, Cleveland? West of Cleveland? Uh, originally, nobody. Originally he was the left flank, but they, once he advanced, he exposed his left flank to, because again he was advancing northeast with a, against the south facing enemy. So that opened up his flank, <clears throat> and so they brought uh, Colonel Preston Pond's brigade out of uh, General Daniel Ruggles' division of Brown's Court. They patched that out and then brought that up on the left. <laughs> uh, and then they spent the morning faced off against the Gallows. Heavy skirmishing, but not a general fight. Over here? Ready? In my younger days of reading of Shallow, uh, I read that the big delay in, was the Southerners, when they got into the Yankee camps, they raided the camps and got food, and, yeah. and they were raiding them, and 
And that, and the, the officers had to come and get them to quit doing that and let's get on with them. They yeah. certainly did, yeah. The, the, the sacking the Union camps was a major delay. It was oh, about 45 minutes. Okay, you haven't brought that out today. Well, that happened after well, this is later. after the attack happen, on Prentice's That camp. didn't happen to the 6th yeah. Mississippi. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't capture anything. Yeah, the 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 Confederates didn't fall out to loot the camps until after they captured the camps. That happened around nine o'clock. Uh, okay, so that's later on. Yeah, yeah. When Prentice cat when uh, uh, when uh, Shaver and Wood and uh, and uh, the Glad remnants of Gladden's brigade drive these guys back and capture these camps, these are the camps that they sack. <coughs> and this is where that delay of about forty five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. John, yeah. Well, on the west, I thought when it was, you know, Preston Pond and things, like, wasn't Morgan's little cavalry? He was over there yeah. too. Morgan's, kind of Morgan's detachment was over there, yeah. Skirmishing over there too. Yep. Yeah. Mostly dismounted, I think. Mm -hmm. And Breckenridge was in the back. Breckenridge was coming up behind. He was the reserve corps. Yeah. And then again, but again, <laughs> as they all came up, their brigades got carved off and sent hither and yon. To wherever they needed to be, so that by the middle of the morning, after the, after they finally overcome the first Union camp, the four Confederate corps commanders uh, gave up their command, gave up their duties, and they redistributed command to uh, each of them was in charge of a sector, not necessarily their own men, uh, but but a sector. So you know, Hardy was in charge of the of the West, and then Polk, and then Bragg. Finding Breckenridge over on the eastern side of the battlefield. But yeah, not necessarily commanding the men they were supposed to command. Everything was so mixed up and so confused by that time, these commands were just not together. All right, well, thank you very much. And if anybody wants to see the next, uh, the next program I do, it's the 154th Tennessee program. I have a pocket.